it. Is this working? Is this thing on? Uh, it seems to be. It seems to be. Ah, excellent, excellent. Camera angle seems to be all right. Granted, uh, don't exactly have a decent setup right now. But, uh, this will do. This will do. This will do indeed. All right. It's been a long time since I've done something like this. Um, excellent. Excellent. Ugh. I got some um, stream elements thing going on and had to figure out how that worked because it updated and it's a new experience and and I had to fix everything. I've got my companion who has decided to join me and grace me with her presence. I have I have my tea. I have my other tea. I have a couple books. And I have my incense. Because how could I not feature my skull incense? Ah, uh, so let's see. Who do we have in chat? It is three... L-M-Y-R-4. Oh, pleasure to make your acquaintance. I do believe you are the only person here right now, so I am performing to an audience of one. Um, let's see here. I see. All right. So, what to do first? Let's keep it simple. Maybe something from Edgar Allan Poe. I was supposed to plan a list, um, but things didn't quite work out that way. So I'm winging it. Uh. What shall I narrate? We'll do something relatively, relatively simple. I know what we can open up with. It's a classic. And it's short! The Conqueror Worm. Yes. Excellent. We'll start with that. That'll be my warm-up. I suppose for my warm-up, I might do something... I was going to be in that pirate Borg game that never off, uh, never got off the ground. Ah, yes. The cursed pirate Borg game. All right. The Conqueror Worm by Edgar Allan Poe. I get to read these uh, with my sharp cat eyes. Marvelous. Lo, tis a gala night, within the lonesome latter years, An angel throng bewinged bedight, In veils and drowned in tears. Sit in a theatre to see, A play of hopes and fears, While the orchestra breathes fitfully The music of the spheres. Mimes in the form of God on high mutter and mumble low, and hither and thither fly, mere puppets they who come and go. At bidding of vast formless things that shift the scenery to and fro, flapping from out their condor wings, invisible woe. That motley drama, oh be sure, it shall not be forgot, With its phantom chased for evermore by a crowd that sees it not. Through a circle that ever returneth in to that selfsame spot, And much 
of madness and more of sin, and horror, the soul of the plot. But see amid the mimic rout a crawling shape intrude, a blood-red thing that writhes from out the scenic solitude. It writhes, it writhes, with mortal pangs. The mimes become its food, and the angels sob and vermin fangs in human gore imbued. Out, out are the lights, out all, and over each quivering form, the curtain, a funeral pall, comes down with the rush of a storm. And the angels, all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, affirm that the play is the tragedy man, and its hero the conqueror worm. It's been a long time since I've narrated that one. Not bad for off the cuff, I suppose. Oh, this is a crowded, crowded little tray table. All right. <clears throat> oh, I did forget something. Let me see. I do have OBS recording. Um, you know, I will use the OBS recording. I will keep to that. I won't try and record on two programs at once. That could add uh, artifacts and the like that I would not like. All right, let's see here. Users in chat. Uh, zero, zero, Rihanna. O, one, Ella. Uh, Drapsnat. Zimik. It's the weird thing about Twitch. Never know who is actually in the stream. Uh, I'm going to set this cup over here so I can actually move things around without... Eh, look at the little smoke. Uh, without too much trouble. So, Friday the 13th. Let's see... If we can find something fitting. Some submissions, but alas, alack. Let's do. Evergreens in an endless autumn. I recorded this one recently. And can I get. Yes, excellent. I can bring my mouse over here and I can actually make use of things and move them around. So. I recorded this one recently, so it's still relatively familiar to my brain, and it is seasonal. Evergreens in an Endless Autumn by Mac Ralston. Hmm. Maybe a little vocal warm up ahead of time just to be on the safe side. <clears throat> Oh, what to do to die today at a minute or two till two? A distinctly difficult thing to say, but harder still to do. For there'll be a tattoo at twenty till two, a rat a tat 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 tum, and the dragon will come when he hears the drum at a minute or two till two today at a minute or two till two. Uh, six. before 
I find the voice, but we'll see. Six months have passed since the cool winds of September raked through the brittle grass of Valley Glean like fingers in an old woolen blanket. Yet the fall has not since ended. That same cold breeze, as sharp and as bitter as a dagger at midnight, still cuts through the piles of shriveled brown bodies that line the streets, and the deep blue hue of the sky has saturated to a shade beyond what any of us could have ever dared to comprehend. It is an eternal blue. The fall started just as most often do, after a hot, wet summer that crescended into a clangy, thunderous lightning storm. Mala and I were out rocking on the porch step. We had exhausted the day, plucking our small orchard nearly bare of fresh apples. When the air began to taste of oncoming rain and the song of cicadas swiftly stopped, like a spinning record without a needle. We watched and we waited until the pitter-patter on the tin roof began. And then the crack of God's whip licked the sky with a scab of light, and down came the rest of the water. It was a heavy rain, heavier than any other that summer. Yet from where we were perched, Mama and I were dry as bones. The cattle, however, were not so fortunate. And while the pigs might have had a field day in the fresh mud, all the other critters of the night were hunkered down as we were, including the chickens in their coop and the dog from the yard. And old Betsy had found her way under Mama's chair, after I had spoiled her with the rest of my half-chewed honey crisp, and continued in that position until we called it a night. Thus ended the last day of summer. When we awoke the following morning, a fresh September morning, neither Mama nor myself expected the harsh transition into the fall equinox that awaited us outside. The sky was now a bright, cheery blue. Every drop of rain six feet under the dew-covered browning grass, and the trees radiated the same yellow as the sunlight, spun with hints of red like gala apples. We moseyed on down the steps and into the yard, taking Betsy with us, and there wasn't a trace of humidity in the air to be found. It was a crisp air, nearly as crinkled as the leaves beneath our boots, and as cool and nippy as we had hoped for, <clears throat> and as cool and nippy as we had hoped for after the dog days had ended. The dog and other animals felt the same. Old Betsy was frolicking, the, crow the cows were grazing, what little green grass remained, and the chickens were out of their coop. The mud had dried, but that didn't stop the pigs from their play. Scattered across our land and all throughout Valley Glean were the shed leaves of maple and ash, same as the ones that snapped as we strutted. The children kicked them down empty blocks and rode them to school as passengers in their spokes. Despite the breeze that slung like a bumblebee, there was a certain warmth throughout our little town, and as soon as I had bundled myself in, the gi in that gifted jacket from Mama that hung in the closet since Christmas past, I could feel it too. Thus ended the first day of autumn. The sight that beheld us the following morning was nothing shy of disorienting. In fact, I had mistakenly assumed myself to be drunk on rum when I had first noticed the color coming through the window blinds. A blue, nearly purple, shade that stretched across the room like a rug. I had hopped from my slumber in thinking I had slept well past the morning dew, but the still clicking the still clicking clock swore to me that it was only a quarter past six. Peering through the window only furthered my suspicions. The sky was a near black, and the rising sun appeared to be setting already. The shrubbery along the window sill was also alarming, nearly kissed brown with splotches of bare branches. The entire landscape looked as if God had laden his brush heavy with the idyllic colors of an auburn twilight, 
only the day had just begun. Thus, in the same way it had started, ended the second day of autumn. On the third day, just as all the days since, the darkness of night was broken by the unrelenting gaze of blue that swept throughout our land, only day by day increasing in its saturation. It is as if a sponge has been left to soak in a bucket of paint, and day by day what little hint of orange or yellow remained in that sky slowly rots into blackish blue. It is not only the sky that rots, however, but the trees, the grasses, and the rest of the summer's flora. In their places, laced across the front and backyards alike, wrap the gangling vines of gourds and pumpkins that grow far beyond what God himself had intended. One such, a great squash of the Connecticut fields, had by that point eclipsed the tire of my 68 Chevy like it were the moon. It has since engulfed it. That afternoon, as the last of the summer's warm breezes clashed against the howling winds of autumn's birthing pains, there was a great storm that rattled the house and shook the trees, dumping a great many leaves into the yard and scattering them about. The continued gusts of cold air struck the windows and rolled some of the gourds down the hill like oblong bowling balls, and the surges of power they caused by snapped power lines throughout the valley glean rendered my CPAP breathing machine useless, and I dared not sleep that night without it. Thus ended the third day of autumn. The morning that followed I had awoken with a strain in my eyes. Though the blinds were all closed and the doors all shut, the house was bathed in the vivid hue of a vibrant blue and the cold nip of the outside air. I checked the thermostat. It was nearly 40 degrees. In a place like Valley Glean, a temperature that chilly was only seen around Christmas time. Never that early in the year, but my wife felt it too. She had awoken with a cough, a cold, and I fared my best to remedy her symptoms with a piping warm mug of coffee, drizzled with honey from the comb. She thanked me and sat before the foggy window, bundled in a blanket, until calling me over to make note of the outstretched vines that had traveled down the lonesome road toward Valley Glean Square. The gourds were now the size of terracotta clay jars, and the pumpkins were as wide as hay bales. Bent over them like crooked, jagged guardian angels were the barren trees that spread their leaves far and wide, so far and wide that not even a blade of browning grass saw the sun. And that yellow specter, too, despite having only just arisen, reared his glistening head for what seemed to be only moments before ducking beneath the horizon again and shading the land in pitch-black darkness. Thus ended the fourth day of autumn. The fifth began as the fourth had, with the sheer sheen of the cloudless autumn sky and the raspy coughing of my wife beside me. She had been gasping for breath all night long, and when we had both finally tuckered out from restlessness, it seemed that rest was only a short reprieve. When we had both awoken to the brightness through the window blinds, I had wrongfully assumed her complexion to be the result of the strange color that emitted from outside. I was wrong. Her skin was now the shade of a duckling, as if she were ill from jaundice, and her sunken eyes were the deeper, richer tint that the, of the same color, nearly orange. Her hair was fallen out in clumps, and she had lost a tooth in the night. 
She gripped me with one hand, coughed into her other, and, as it trembled, extended the sprinkled red along her yellowed fingers to my eyes. I had called Dr. Sampson not five minutes later. After bringing poor Mama a glass of cold water, nearly frozen despite being left on the kitchen counter the night before, Dr. Sampson answered abruptly as if expected and informed me of her symptoms before I even uttered a word. My wife, it seems, was not alone to suffer her illness in Valley Gleam. However, just as for the others, not much was there to change but to let whatever it was simply run its course. For the remainder of the day, Mama sat silent, except for whimpers of Betsy beneath her rocker, and watched as the foul, deep blue of the empty air, void of any fowl that must have migrated south prematurely, seeped into every corner of the sky above, and the or orange and brown crept across the ground below. The only hint of greenery to be seen were those few selected trees that, for whatever God's reasons, never seemed to shed their leaves, the evergreens. It was that ever so green that was a comfort in some strange way to the both of us, though the companionship of that tinge was only shortly lived. Before long, the screeching sunset, even earlier on arrival than the day before, burned every color of the earth and deep blue sky above into a molten shade of orange, like the courier and Ives print if the colors began to bleed out onto the floor. Thus ended the fifth day of autumn. There was a great squealing that had awoken me from my slumber the morning of the sixth day, and immediately I had clutched the cold hand of Mama to make sure she was all right. It wasn't her. The screaming, instead, had come from outside, beyond the windows of which, of which rich blue lights seemed to ooze into our farmhouse. I had taken my coat from the rack and made it a step down the creaking porch stairs when my slippers slipped into a thick bun bundling of dried, dried out leaves, a pile of crackling orange and brown whose colors were far deeper than my foot. I lifted my shoe from its depths, but as I surveyed the rest of the yard, I realized rather quickly that there was no alter alternate footing. The entirety of our land was coated in fallen leaves, a layer of rustling litter at least a foot deep. Then the squealing came again, this time louder and seemingly closer. I trudged through the browning colors in my pajamas and jacket until I reached the splintering fence which, beyond it, held the likes of those chickens and their coop and the cattle and the pigs. No such creature stirred any more. Instead, the wailing of the hog which had awoken me came from beneath a dense pile of leaves, and I brushed them aside to see Clarabelle, our potbelly, sputter a gurgle of blood and fall limp against the dead grass beneath her. There was fungus and a great many toadstools protruding from her skin and all around her. Along the patch of earth were budding mushrooms that stuck out from between mounds of leaves and the carcasses of the cattle who had grazed the grasses bare. Clarabelle was always Mama's pig, and I had taken the bell around her neck with me as I plodded back up to our home, reverently holding it in my shivering hands and wondering how to break the news to my wife, that all the livestock, including her prized pig, were now dead. But there was a bigger problem inside. 
Mama was sitting at the table, the steam from a popping cup of joe rising from her grip. She turned to me with a faded, cracked smile, and I stopped cold in my tracks. My wife was orange, and the thin skin that surrounded her beady, shrunken eyes was a sickly brown. They were the same saturated tones as the leaves that fluttered across the lawn. Immediately, I tried to hoist her to her feet, but her weight nearly snapped between my arms. She fell back into the seat with another tired cough and shook her head a silent no. I clutched her cold hands in mine, still holding the bell. She took in a breath, which was increasingly harder to do as the fall continued, and gazed up at me tearfully, her lips cracking audibly. I began to weep as she fell into herself. Thus ended the sixth day of autumn. I failed to rest all night, merely sat up in bed and watched as the blackness brightened into blue outside, but was awoken from whatever stupor may have clutched me by the hideous odor that penetrated my nostrils. The air was thin enough already, but when the stench had seized me, I gasped and burst into a fit of coughing and nearly vomited out on the floor. I grabbed the nearby CPAP machine resting beside the bed and pressed it to my lips as if it were a gas mask from the Great War, and huffed and puffed. I could, for once in many days, breathe again. Downstairs, my wife, or rather the husk that my now dearly departed had left behind, was rotten, withered in that chair in the kitchen. Old Betsy had smelled her, too. Only the soft white fur from her coat was now the shade of cinnamon as she whined at Mama's shriveled feet. The mug of coffee was still placed upon her table, frozen over as the temperature only grew chiller, and I reached out to touch her brown skin. Her fingers snapped upon the lightest brush of my hand, and crumbled to the floor. I gagged into my mask and ran to the other side of the room where the only comfort to be found was the basket of apples that never made their way into one of Mama's pies. They were all a putrid brown and writhing with worms. That afternoon, I called Dr. Sampson again after covering all the doors and windows. Whatever that blue light, wherever that blue light leaked through. It now hurt to stare at for long periods, and the mere color dug into my jaw and rang the drums of the ears. When the doctor finally did answer, he sounded both excitable and terrified all in the same breath. He begged me not to go outside, not to dare smell it, and I questioned him why but he never gave a cohesive answer. He rambled on about leaves and lungs, a mutual exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and how the earth itself was shedding. I then asked him, Why then, both of us were still breathing, what little air we had. But he didn't know. I did, however. We were the evergreen. Unfortunately for old Betsy, though, she was not. Before the day was through, that cinnamon-colored fur had completely fallen off like needles from a larch, leaving behind only the wrinkly skin of a now baldened bitch. Until, at last gasp, that had fallen off, too. Thus ended... 
the first week of autumn. Before long, despite how grueling it might have seemed, that week became weeks. Halloween came and went, the most frightening of them all by mere virtue of the season, and then those weeks became months. Six terrible months, so much as we can tell. Those of us who dared to step outside, perhaps with no alternative, our eyes covered and bodies wrapped in what warmth we had, took to throwing as many bodies as we could manage into the warm and bonfires that crackle now, day and night along the hills to rid valley glean of the smell that keeps many of us awake. The ones that remain left on curbs of which children no longer walk nor ride their bicycles merely seep back into the earth and keep the corn stalks and gourds and pumpkins ever growing. Their scent so potent that a whiff of the wind tastes of one of Mama's pies and goads me to gag and cry every time. Every autumnal meal, the same squash, day in, day out, elicits the same reaction. Everything outside our windows remains frozen in place just as the fall has been, and we often collectively contemplate whether or not the strange season of the valley lingers beyond its borders, especially where it is not yet autumn. The clocks however, have lost all purpose of their ticking, and therefore we cannot tell with any certainty whether or not we have even reached the winter months as we suspect. All we know is that the days grow ever shorter, some seemingly less than mere hours, or at least what used to be hours. Father Briggs now raves on at the pulpit, foaming at the lip about the end of days we have found ourselves in. He swears that death's harvest will be plentiful, and that, perchance, the colors of hell have fallen onto the earth in shades of fire and brimstone. Seems Dr. Sampson believes his rantings. We pray daily that the warmth of a radiant spring will thaw the once lively town of Valley Glean and end this endless fall. I only fear if an impending spring buds what fauna and flora lie in the wake of autumn and winter's chill back to life. Perhaps this eternal autumn is sparing us from whatever or whomever else may spring along with it. The End That was uh, an interesting take on an apocalyptic scenario wherein a season simply doesn't end. Imagine a summer that never ended where the, the grasses burn brown and dead and the heat just keeps going and you get all sweaty and sticky. Ugh. That would be a hellish nightmare as well. Or winter. Spring might be manageable. I don't know. All right. Well, we did get some people that popped in, and then they disappeared. Curses. Um, but such is the way of things. Probably had no idea what was going on. Just some random person with funny contacts ranting into a microphone. Speaking of contacts, I'm going to get up close and personal so I can make sure that they are uh, mostly straight. This one's a little... There we are. All right, well, let's see. What shall we do next? All right. Hmm. Oh, 
this offer off of. Oh, I know. I do enjoy... There is one Lovecraft story that I wouldn't mind narrating. Yes, I'll read the entirely the entirety of the quest of unknown Kadath. Oh hell no. That would be a nightmare. Uh the terrible old man. This is going to be fun, since, um, you know, the eyes don't make it very easy to read, but theatrics, and so on. Oh. There are a quest of Iranon. Maybe I'll do that one next. All right. Now, one of the things I like about this particular edition um, of the collected works of H.P. Lovecraft um, is it starts with these interesting little blurbs, um, these little historical elements that are uh, a pretty cool little touch. Um, written on January 28th of 1920, the terrible old man betrays the influence of Lord Dunsany in spite of its realistic setting. Several stories in Dunsany's The Book of Wonder, uh, 1912, in particular The Probable Adventure of the Three Literary Men, uh, tell of attempted robberies that end badly for the perpetrators. Lovecraft introduces the fictitious New England town of Kingsport in this story, uh, the names of the three robbers reflect the influx of Italian, Portuguese, and Polish immigrants into New England, uh, and specifically into Providence. Uh, the story was first published in the tryout, uh, July of 1921. <clears throat> All right. Ah. If anybody else has arrived, feel free to say hello. Um, I don't bite, just scratch a little. Of course, I have to hold this right up to my face because the eyes. Oh, the things I do. It was the design of Angelo Ricci and Joe Xanek and Manuel Silva, to call on the terrible old man. This old man dwells all alone in a very ancient house on Water Street, near the sea, and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly feeble, which forms a situation very attractive to men of the professions of Messrs. Ricci, Xanek, and Silva, for the profession was nothing less dignified than robbery. The inhabitants of Kingsport say and think many things about the terrible old man, which generally keep him safe from the attention of gentlemen like Mr. Ricci and his colleagues, despite the almost certain fact that he hides a fortune of indefinite magnitude somewhere about his musty and venerable abode. He is, in truth, a very strange person, Believed to have been a captain of East India clipper ships in his day, so old that no one can remember when he was young, and so taciturn that few know his real name. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place, he maintains a strange collection of large stone, 
oddly grouped and painted so that they resemble the idols in some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard, or to break the small paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles. But there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folk who sometimes steal up to the house to peer in through the dusty panes. These folk say that on a table, in a bare room, on the ground floor, are many peculiar bottles, in each a small piece of lead, suspended, pendulum-wise, from a string. And they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tom, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Mate Ellis. And that whenever he speaks to a bottle, the little lead pendulum within makes certain definite vibrations as if in answer. Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Angelo Ricci and Joe Zanuck and Manuel Silva were not of Kingsport blood. They were of that new heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous alien stock which lies outside the charmed circle of New England life and traditions, and they saw in the terrible old man merely a tottering, almost helpless greybeard who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane, and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. They were really quite sorry in their way for the lonely, unpopular old fellow whom everybody shunned, and at whom all the dogs barked singularly. But business is business, and to a robber whose soul is in his profession, there is a lure and a challenge about a very old and very feeble old about a very old and a very feeble old man who has no account at the bank and who pays for his few necessities at the village store with Spanish gold and silver minted two centuries ago. Messrs. Ricci, Zanuck, and Silva selected the night of April 11th for their call. Mr. Ricci and Mr. Silva were to interview the poor old gentleman, while Mr. Zanuck waited for them and their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor car in Ship Street by the gate in the tall rear wall of their host's grounds. Desire to avoid needless explanations in case of unexpected police intrusion prompted these plans for a quiet and unostentatious departure. As prearranged, the three adventurers started out separately in order to prevent any evil-minded suspicions afterward. Messrs. Ricci and Silva met in, the w in Water Street by the old man's front gate, and although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones through the budding branches of the gnarled trees, they had more important things to think about than mere idle superstitions. They feared it might be unpleasant work making the terrible old men look loquacious concerning his hoarded gold and silver. Four aged sea captains are notably st <clears throat> for aged sea captains are notably stubborn and perverse. Still, he was very old and very feeble, and there were two visitors. Messrs. Ricci and Silva were experienced in the art of making unwilling persons voluble, and the screams of a weak an exceptionally venerable man can be easily muffled. So they moved up to the one lighted window 
and heard the terrible old man talking childishly to his bottles with pendulums. Then they donned masks and knocked politely at the weather-stained oaken door. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. Zanuck, as he fidgeted restlessly in the covered motor car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted, and he did not like the hideous screams he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the deed. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Very nervously, he watched that narrow oaken gate in the high and ivy-clad stoned wall. Frequently, he consulted his watch and wondered at the delay. Had the old man died before revealing his treasure where his treasure was hidden? And had a thorough search become necessary? Mr. Zanuck did not like to wait so long in the dark in such a place. Then he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the walk inside the gate, heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, and saw the narrow, heavy door swing inward. And in the pallid glow of the single dim street lamp, he strained his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out of that sinister house which loomed so close behind. But when he looked, he did not see what he had expected, for his colleagues were not there at all, but only the terrible old man leaning quietly on his knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. Zanuck had never before noticed the color of the man's eyes. Now he saw that they were yellow. Little things make considerable excitement in little towns which is the reason that Kingsport people talked all that spring and summer about the three unidentifiable bodies horribly slashed with many cutlasses and horribly mangled as by the tread of many cruel boot heels, which the tide had washed in. And some people even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor car found in Ship Street, or certain especially inhuman cries, probably of a stray animal or a migratory bird, heard in the night by wakeful citizens. But in this idle village gossip, the terrible old man took no interest at all. He was by nature reserved, and when one is aged and feeble, one's reserve is doubly strong. Besides, so ancient a sea captain must have witnessed scores of things much more stirring in the far-off days of his unremembered youth. The End <clears throat> Oh, my back is not happy with me. <clears throat> uh, a moment as I check on some things. Is something else entirely. Let's go back here. You are a cat, I know. Apparently, there is a to do. Oh, that was unrelated. 
<laughs> Excellent. Um, and over here. here join me have a seat yeah. <laughs> uh, all right well, let's see what to do next let's do another creepy pasta i will keep um the quest of irinon in mind um creepy pasta creepy pasta you know what maybe a classic Ah, now this one here, it's called The Last... It, this is not a classic, but... Um, this is by an author. It's called The Last Day of October. It's by an author who does a series of um, stories that are all in a shared world. Um, it's kind of... Oh, uh, would you... I, I can't remember if it's... Um, 1800s or more colonial era uh, uh, America, um, but it has like there are fae creatures and and it's, it's very fascinating. Um, and I I have uh, uh, permission to narrate them, but they are tricksy. They are quite tricksy. Um, let's see here. Oh, interesting. Is a long one. Um, I'll put a pin in that one. Uh, let's see here. I think I remember this one. I might actually narrate. Oh, wait, no, this is a short one. And it's by one named Nixon. It's an old one. Let's see. All right. I've never read this one. I opened it up to read it. And oh, it's an okay length. Um, we'll go ahead. We'll go ahead and take a look at this one. Uh, do we have anybody new? Anybody new? Anybody new? Um, possibly it's hard to interpret this. Nightman versus Dayman. So one of the things that's always perplexed me about Twitch is um, it'll say that I have one viewer, but the number of users in chat will be something like 16. <clears throat> and I'm sure there's an explanation that'll make me feel stupid for being confused about it. But until I get that explanation... Oh, Mr. Grim Reaper Pasta. Hello. I'm about to tell another story. I've never read this one, so I might stumble a little bit. Um, that being said, I think I'm going to switch windows and put... and put what I'm narrating in that window... And OBS in the bigger one. 
And there we are. You see, for example, we have Mr. Grim Reaper Pasta. He is chatting. Oh, wait, nope. Now it does say I have two viewers. Excellent. All right, well, let's take a look. Uh, Leonard's Pumpkins. Uh, this is by uh, someone, or at least I assume it's by this person. Uh, it's one of those creepypastas that doesn't have a listed author, but the way they commented on their comments thread, it seems like this is the author. Named Nixon. N-Y-X-S-O-N. Um, all right. Hello, Nala. Okay. Kitty cat. All right, Leonard's Pumpkins. I moved out on my own just a few months ago. My house is in a pretty decent neighborhood, and at 25, going on 26, I'm doing pretty good career-wise. Socially, however, I am lacking. I mean, yes, I had friends back where I used to live, but... After high school and college, everyone just kind of went their separate ways, which is understandable. Being a high-functioning autistic, it's kind of hard for me to meet new people, especially when your autism makes even picking up a phone to call your parents seem like a chore. I did manage to take one friend with me. My best friend and roommate, Nix. She's the cutest black cat I've ever seen, and my dad found her for me about 15 years ago when she was just a kitten. Come on up. Stop meowing. Get up here. And she was just a kitten. Oh, oh, your feet are wet. I dread to think of what made them wet. Um, we lived together in this two-story house for about two or three months. It was the night before Halloween, and I was carving a pumpkin for a jack-o'-lantern. This would be my first Halloween alone, but my parents were coming for my birthday on the 2nd of November. I was pretty congested. It was bad enough that I called out for work, which I don't often do. Still, I wanted to be a nice guy and try to give out candy. Hell, I just needed to socialize a little bit. Who knew? Maybe one of the neighbors would be a nice lady my age. I shrugged cynically, knowing my luck. Even if there, even if there were, I'd hardly talk to any of these people. I finished my jack-o'-lantern while listening to some gothic music to set the mood, all the while sniffling and trying to pop my ears. I had made a career out of my artistic skills. Luckily, this did not apply to jack-o'-lanterns, though. Oh, whoops. Read that wrong? The joy of doing this the first time. I had made a career out of my artistic skills, luckily. This did not apply to jack-o'-lanterns, though. Sadly. The finished product of my pumpkin carving, which broke both carving knives and took a serrated kitchen knife to finish, looked like a disfigured demon with a facial tick. I was both amused and slightly disturbed at what my clumsy hands had created, but still satisfied enough to keep it. The next night went pretty well, save for my now congested throat and chest and sinus, sh sinus pressure. I received plenty of reactions to my jack-o'-lantern, ranging from laughs to slight recoils in terror. As the evening went by, the trick-or-treaters became even more disturbed, and at the end of the night I found out why. I looked at the pumpkin, and what had started out looking like an abomination had shriveled into something that literally looked 
like a twisted skull. I coughed and chuckled. Uh, feeling somewhat sympathetic toward it, I felt like I wanted to shrivel up, too. I woke up, probably about noon the next day, uh, feeling even worse than last night. I was dizzy as hell, I couldn't breathe, and I was almost completely deaf. My ears rang and felt as if they would explode. I didn't want to get up. I had no real reason to, but I did anyway. I at least wanted to check the mail or get something to eat and maybe take some decongestant. As I stumbled downstairs and shuffled outside in my robe and slippers to get the mail, I noticed that my pumpkin had vanished. I had already planned on throwing it out anyway, uh, but it was still my—I was still mildly surprised that it was just gone. Someone must have stolen it, um, either late last night or this morning. I didn't care. I'm sick, and they did me a favor either way. I went inside with the mail and thought very little of it. I had myself a bowl of chicken noodle soup and a coke. As soon as my meds, um, as that, and a coke as I took my meds, then shuffled upstairs to lie in bed and watch TV in my room. As crappy as I felt, I didn't want to do anything else. I woke up at eight thirty-six. By what my clock told me, my TV still playing. I felt even more so dead to the world and could barely lift my head. When I finally managed to do so, I saw Nyx curled up at my feet. It was such a precious sight, and with my hoarse voice, I said, Hi, Nixie! And she didn't respond. She must have been fast asleep. I reached to pet her when I felt her body, stiff and cold. Again, she didn't move. Oh, God. She was dead. My best friend of 15 years died beside me while I slept. My hands shook, and I immediately began to weep. I wept continuously my head feeling full and unable to really hear my own sobs through my clogged ears. Even worse, my sobs were interrupted by worsening coughing fits. How could this happen to me? And on the day before my birthday, no less. I sobbed and coughed bitterly when the irony hit me that my birthday was known as the Hispanic Day of the Dead. Happy birthday to me. Fuck my life. Around midnight, I finally stood up, although teetering, and took my cat's lifeless body downstairs and got a shovel out of the garage. I went to the backyard and dug a hole next to my room window. I placed a stone where I buried her to mark her grave, in memory of the best friend I ever had. As I dizzily walked back to my house in a mix of soft sobs, sniffles, and coughs, I thought about how this is, a, is probably a sign that I need to get out and socialize more. Fuck my autism. My dad's right. I, I need friends. My thoughts were interrupted when I got to my front porch and noticed the pumpkin that was sitting there in the darkness. I almost mistook it for the jack-o'-lantern I thought had been taken. When I got closer, I noticed the light inside was red, almost like an LED was inside it. And the pumpkin 
was as black as the night. A cat's face was carved into this black pumpkin. What psychopath would do this to me? Was I being mocked? Who the hell was watching me to know that I had just buried my black cat and made a fucking effigy of her in a pumpkin? I screamed in a mixture of rage and grief and I, as I hurled the pumpkin into the street in front of my house, dashing it to pieces and watching the red light disperse. I then stumbled inside, feeling even sicker than before. I woke up three hours later, down on the couch. By this mean I was, uh, by this I mean my face was literally in the seat of the couch, and the rest of me was on the floor. I must have collapsed in a mixture of all the grief, confusion, anger, and sickness. I attempted. Oh. Was that lost my spot? I attempted to stand up and walk, but after making it to my recliner, I collapsed again. At this point, I was so dead that I couldn't hear at all, and the cold mixed with hollowed out feel uh, feeling of losing Nix made it almost impossible to feel anything. I wanted to go to sleep forever. Knowing that was probably stupid of me, and feeling the inability to actually go to sleep, I decided to see what was on TV. I picked up the remote for the downstairs TV and clicked on it. I clicked the remote again. The hell? I thought aloud. I saw the LED on the remote come on. Why wasn't the TV coming on as well? Oh, don't tell me it's dead too. I just bought the damn thing. For the first time today, I left something, I felt something other than grief. And strangely, I welcomed it. My frustration turned to slight amusement when I considered the thought that I might find another pumpkin on my porch, this time for my TV. Out of sheer curiosity, I decided to actually walk outside and check. I slowly and carefully stood up to counteract the lightheaded feeling I had and shuffled to the door. Sure enough, as soon as I opened the door, I saw a different shaped and colored pumpkin than before. I laughed my ass off. Even as screwed up as I felt, I laughed through my coughing fits. Whoever the psychopath was that was leaving pumpkins of who died on my porch, they sure had a sense of humor. I think my head cold made me a little delirious because the situation uh, should have been more unnerving. All things considered... Uh, oh, lost my spot again. Let's see here. Ah, there we go. Um, should have been uh, more unnerving, all things considered. After I stood back up from cackling hoarsely and coughing, I noticed the pumpkin's skin color. It wasn't a color I normally saw in a pumpkin. It had a fleshy olive to it. My stomach sank when I looked down at my arm and back to the pumpkin. It was my skin tone. I panicked, and the next thing I remember... I was in front of the pumpkin as if it had just appeared there. I keep, keep fading, losing my spot. Um, as if I had 
it had just appeared there. There we go. The pumpkin was unlit, and with it being 3 a.m., I could barely make out what it was. Suddenly, the inside of the jack-o'-lantern lit up, revealing to me what I had dreaded to see. It was my face. Oh, no. Oh, hell no. These pumpkins weren't markers of who died. They were warnings. Some serial killer must be marking his targets with jack-o'-lanterns or something. Shit. Panicking. Uh, I bottled inside. More like floated, actually, as dizzy as I felt. I started upstairs to my bedroom to get my ninja sword out from under my pillow. This asshole wasn't going to take me without a fight. As I got about halfway upstairs, the realization hit me. If this jack-o'-lantern killer had killed Nix, how do you make it look if she... How do you make it look like she died of natural causes? I got my answer as I rounded the corner and entered my bedroom. I saw Nix curled up on my bed as I had found her earlier, as if I hadn't buried her, lying next to my limp body. I can't tell if I was horrified or stunned at the surreal nature of what I had just seen, but out of reflex, I gasped. This sent me into a coughing fit, worse than the previous one. I coughed as if my lungs were trying to come up, my head pounded as I whooped and hacked, and I collapsed to the floor as my vision blurred, and then it narrowed. The obituary read, Leonard Timothy Schmidt, November 2nd, 1986 to November 2nd, 2012. After two agonizing days of being bedridden with a temperature above 100 degrees, Leonard succumbed at 3.33 in the morning on his 26th birthday. His father and mother, who had come to visit him, found him lifeless in his bed that morning. He was lying with his beloved feline, Nix. Forensics concluded that after 15 long years, she died of old age, curled up next to her best friend merely hours prior. The end. Now, if anybody is confused, the comment uh, that Nixon uh, had left um, when somebody expressed confusion about the ending uh, was that it was basically a weird fever dream that he was having as he was dying. Okay. Okay. I think I could do better, though. I think we can find a better story. Let's, let's find... Let's find a proper creepy, creepy pasta. Um... Maybe going the classic route is the way to go. Unless there's any suggestions from the peanut gallery. If you have any peanuts to share, I'm a little, a little peckish. Oh, that is the wrong page. Uh, uh. Wow. Time is flying. Uh, I am going a little bit, a little bit of a break. I'm going to get up and stretch my legs a bit. <clears throat> I've been getting shit for sleep. Um, usually I'm lucky to get about four to six hours in a night. Um, it's everything I can do to make sure I wake up in time to go to work. 
and I meant to take a nap before this, because I'm old, um, but never did. So this tea is energy tea. Then I get to decide what else I'm going to do this weekend. Let's get some more. Let's get another incense. This is a cool little incense holder. I will, oh, whoops, can't set that there. I'll set it on the cat. I now have a cat sitting behind me. That was um, to be expected, I suppose, since I'm sitting on the edge of my the edge of my seat. Come on. go. This is one of those, um, oh, what do they call them? Uh, reverse intake? I, I don't know. Uh, the, the smoke from the incense goes down and, uh, filters out through the dragon's mouth. Uh, let's see here. That eye is fine. This one's a little wobbly. There we go. That's a little bit better. moment. I'm going to go on a brief intermission.
All right, and I am back. Ah, okay. Oh, we reset the chat box. That's a little weird. All right, uh, so this one caught my attention as it is... Um, um, from, well, it, it looks interesting. I'll, I'll read from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> and if you can see, uh, it doesn't look like it's terribly visible. Um, the smoke from the incense is coming out of the dragon's mouth and is pooling into the top of the skull and it's kind of cool. Um, all right. So, <clears throat> I am back to one viewer. Uh, such is life, such is life. All right, so this one is called Out in the Woods. Um, let's see, mic check, one, two. Yes, okay, everything's working. Um, what you are about to read was posted on 4chan's Paranormal X board on Halloween Day of 2013 by an unknown user by the name of Prozac101. Being a daily visitor to X, I was one of the first people to reply to the girl's post, and I think it's best that I tell you now that I was pretty creeped out by what I had read. Probably the most I had been in a long time. It's kind of hard for me to explain the strange feeling I got, but there was something quite different about her story uh, due to the fact that I couldn't stop thinking about it for days after it had been first posted on the board. Just to make everything clear, I am not entirely the original author of this piece, just merely an anonymous editor that felt it was his duty to share Prozac 101's story even further with the world. Um, and that is what caught my attention. So let's take a look at this and see what we can see. This needs to go away. Uh, trying to read this uh, with the enlarged text through these. It's fun. And by fun, I mean it's not fun. But... We suffer for our art. <clears throat> hey, X. Just thought that I'd share a couple spooky stories from my childhood to get everybody all hyped up for Halloween. When I was a child, it was just me and my mother. Uh, we lived in a property owned by my grandma, a three-story old farmhouse right at the fringe of the woods. It was far off the road, down a long, unlit gravel driveway. It felt very isolated at night, being so distant from any other houses, set in an area that hadn't been inhabited for thirty years before we started living in it. Quite often, I was a fairly rambunctious child, so while my mom went off to work, I would occasionally skip the morning bus to school and stay home alone all day. The big house had a habit of feeling incredibly lonely and sparse, so I spent most of my time playing in the forest expanse out back, some distance into the woods far enough that I couldn't hear my mother when she called. There was a toppled pine tree which had crashed into another, an even larger trunk on its way down was now frozen there, forming a long arc over the forest floor. I loved to climb up that jagged stump at the base of this fallen tree and then steady myself to a point just above the middle. I was never able to make it all the way to the top because it felt it just got too steep for me to continue any further, and I had a bad habit of freaking out from how high up I was. One day, I was sitting in my usual spot on the fallen tree, which was a good distance from the ground, just listening to the birds singing and simultaneously feeling the warmth of the sun on my neck, when I heard something strange from underneath that paralyzed me in shock. Hey, kid. I was gripped by a sudden strong surge of fear for a moment. The voice had come from directly underneath me. 
I strained to look down, but couldn't see anything over the edge, the ledge. Uh, for a long time, I just sat there in absolute silence. And I was at the point where I was almost soon to convince myself that I had imagined hearing a man's voice at all. I know you can hear me. His voice was much louder this time. As I yelled something out and scrambled up the log a bit higher, and trembling nervously, I dug my fingernails into the bark and held tight for dear life. I sat there trying to collect my nerves for God knows how long. Although I couldn't see it, the presence of the thing underneath me was still clear. The bird song was much softer and more cautious this time. And when I listened closely, I swear I could hear the faintest echo of human breathing. Gathering all my courage, I vowed to prove to myself that it was all my imagination by leaning over the ledge as far as possible, as far as I possibly could, without slipping right off. Digging hard into the bark behind me, I stretched out along my arms and peered over, getting a full view of the empty forest floor and undergrowth, when suddenly... Come down here or I'll come up and grab you. And it was so loud, it was as if it was being screamed right in my face. I released my grip on the tree in fright and plunged off the platform. I was saved only by grabbing a nearby branch, and for one awful second my bare legs dangled in the cool air. When I pulled myself up, I ran at full speed to the top of the collapsed pine, to the point I had never reached before. I sat there, just below the rustling canopy, pissing myself and staring at the distant base where the splintered wood rose, fully expecting at any moment to see someone crawling rapidly up the pine towards me. Instead, all I heard was the wind whistling in the leaves above and below me, and occasionally snippets of birdsong. It was about two hours before my mother got home and found me, after much worried, searching, trembling, and crying at the top of the fallen tree. Although this incident spooked me and my mother, in time I somehow recovered, exhibiting that naive, hard skin of a child. Although I never went as far into the forest as I used to, and never again even approached that fallen tree. Once, when I was twelve, I had the chore of taking firewood from the shed out back, uh, just at the edge of the woods and to bring it back inside the house. It was a tiresome job, and I always chose to do it at dusk, when the air was brimming with mosquitoes and a swampy fog that usually coated the lawn. By the time I made my last round, I would sprint back to the house, spooked. One of my least favorite... Uh... Doo -doo -doo. Oh, welcome back, Mr. Grim Reaper Pasta. Um, started a new one. It is called Out in the Woods um, by Anonymous. Well, uh, somebody on 4chan. Um, let's see here. One of my least favorite things about this job was that the shed was full of barn owls. If you have ever seen a barn owl's face staring at you from a dark roof corner, then you will know how uncomfortable that shed made me. One of these nights, it got mistier than it had ever been before. A thick silver fog covered everything and limited my line of sight to a short sphere around me. Even though the shed wasn't far from the house, I found myself feeling disoriented, and more than once I walked in the wrong direction, both times, for some reason, walking straight into the woods. By the time I reached my last load, it was too foggy to see the street. 
My eyes stung in the moisture, it, and it made my vision blur. Lurching forward, I managed to walk headfirst into a tree. Doubling over and dropping all of the wood, I was bundling onto my feet with a hard crunch. As I went to pick them up, with my foot throbbing pretty hard, I realized that the ground was too misty for me to see my own knees. I decided to head to the house, since we had more than enough wood for one night. However, it was getting pretty dark, and I couldn't make out any signifiers of which direction I was heading in. Even though I cautiously walked for several feet in all directions, trying to figure out my position in the mists, I still couldn't figure out any point of identification. I couldn't even locate the fence or the gate, and the more I walked, the more I seemed to stumble into trees, pine needles, and mud crunching under my feet instead of dew-covered lawn. After a while, I finally realized that I couldn't even find the shed anymore. And cursing myself for being so dumb while trying to ignore my thumping heart and sense that something else was at play, I became aware I was lost somewhere in the fringe of the forest. Screaming out for my mother at the loudest possible volume was only met with resounding silence from the depths of the mist all around from where I stood, affirming that I had wandered too far from the house to be heard. As a deep panic started to settle on me, I noticed a glimpse of something pink moving against a nearby pine trunk. Coming closer, I saw that it was a ripped-out square of pink paper. On it, there was an arrow pointed left. Looks vaguely like something my mom would might make, I rationalized, uh, to keep me from getting lost. So foolishly, I followed the direction set by that green arrow, shivering in the increasing cold. I kept walking for about five to ten minutes before needing to stop and take a breath. My heart was pounding so fast it was beginning to hurt. As I was sitting down, however, I spied what appeared to be another note fluttering on a nearby trunk. I noticed that this one was embedded with a long nail. It bore another arrow, this one pointing up, and a small, sloppily written note that said, This way. Despite my increasing panic, I convinced myself that these notes were my only shot at getting back before nightfall. I was desperate to get the hell out, and my brow was cold with sweat. So I followed the green arrow to a point where I could just dimly make out another spot of pink, up an inclined of collapsed stumps and leaf litter. At this point, it was getting pretty dark, and I had, strain, I had to strain both my eyes just to see a few meters ahead of me. Following the green arrows, feeling less and less sure of where I was, I stumbled through the woods, groping out in the mists f to feel the for trees, uh, although I was terrified of something unseen grabbing my arm. I came across the third green note, which had another arrow pointing up again this one leading to an increasingly steep slope that I didn't recognize as being anywhere near my house, and with a poorly drawn smiley face above it. At this stage, I became too freaked to cope and started to cry there a little. As I slumped against the pine stump, the possibility that I would be out in these woods all night was beginning to sink in like a syringe being driven into the veins within my arm. I caught a glimpse of another pink square in the near distance. Squinting hard, 
unnerved by these notes, all of which looked fresh and without sign of decay, the previous week's non-stop rain, I read, I read it from afar. Hmm. Not the most thirst quenching of drinks. <clears throat> Energy tea that tastes like bubble gum. <clears throat> what I read made my blood turn cold. I stood to my knees, dead silently, wobbling on them in fear. My ears were sensitive to any tiny prickle of noise in the mist. For a long time, I stood there in the rolling fog, reading and rereading that horrible note over and over again, before a snapping stick somewhere behind me caused me to sprint, blindly, twigs snagging at my ankles and cutting up my face as I ran. Written on the note, in big... Yeah? You don't say. Everyone's a critic. Written on the note, in big green letters, was my name. It felt like I was running for hours, all the while the rain and mist lapped at the back of my neck like the decaying breath of someone running right behind me. Somehow I made it back to the house. All the lights were off, and I struggled to find the keys for a moment. When I found them, I bolted indoors and quickly crawled into bed, where I remained unsleeping till morning. Mom just thought I'd come inside and gone to bed and hadn't thought to leave the lights on. It was a miracle, like, a.k.a. some freakish coincidence, that I even found the house at all. The final incident at that damn house was witnessed only by my mother. Up until then, she had never experienced any of the strange things I had, although we mutually shared the peculiar oppressive quality that the house's interior had on us and its placement in the dreary, imposing woods. Although I was obviously never a popular kid by living way out in the country, in the opposite direction from everyone else at my school, I did make some tight friends in my first year of high school. One of these friends, Amanda was her name, invited me over one night, and I accepted. My mother drove me out to the place, which was about three miles away, then drove back home. The night went well. We watched a horror movie, suitably, uh, devoured some pizza, and probably smoked a little pot. Um, my mother went home alone, where she intended to get some writing done. She worked for a magazine at that point. It was about midnight when I received an off-putting text from Mom in all caps. Is this a prank? I need to know immediately. Thinking it was some kind of joke, I texted back. Calm yourself. Is what a prank? Almost immediately, the response, Are you at the house? Of course, I responded, no, though I was thoroughly weirded out. I didn't receive another message until around 3 a.m. when she told me to go to my grandma's in the morning and to not, by any means, dare go home. I remember those bleak torrents of rain the day I went to my grandmother's, and how terribly soaked I was when I finally got there. It was nearly two towns away. I had to fight the temptation to go home and drop off my bags, but Mom's disturbing messages from last night were enough of a warning to not do so. When I arrived, Mom and Grandma were having lunch. At first, my mother seemed to be in some sort of a, a composed state, but when I got a better look at her, I noticed that all the color had drained from her face and that she was slightly trembling. At one point, 
She even sent a small glass crashing to the floor after flinching at the cat brushing around her ankles. It wasn't until later that night, when my grandma was sound asleep, that she told me what had happened. She went further as to forbid me from telling old grandma out of fear that it would horrify her superstitious soul too much. This was what happened the night when I was at Amanda's, as she described in lurid detail. My mother was sitting on the first story in the living room. When she sat on the couch by the fire, curtains opened to the view of the sunset on the canopy going over her latest draft. Ow. Um, at first, it was so faint she had barely noticed it. But after a while, my mother became aware of and vaguely irritated by a tiny thumping noises near her head at the window. When she went over to investigate, she saw fat brown moths of a kind we often got at that place, buzzing madly into the glass. Reasoning that this was the cause of the sound, she returned to her work however feeling rattled in some way. It was when the noises started to get sharper and louder that she paid more attention and saw that rocks were being thrown at the window from total blackness. Oh. <clears throat> Sorry. Were being thrown at the window from the total blackness of the forest edge. She saw them appear from the shadows of the bush and then fall in an arc and bounce off the window. Looking carefully, she could see small cracks from where the heavy ones had hit, right beside where her head had been moments before. Temporarily captivated, she tried to peer into the darkness uh, enough to make out where the rocks were being thrown from. Then, with startled shock, she jumped back from the window as she saw me standing half behind a tree right near the window, grinning wide and staring at her, my one visible eye stretched wide open, showing all the white She, fig uh, she barely stifled a scream, seeing her own daughter standing there, just staring and smiling. Not only did the figure not move nor blink, it was standing by one of the nearest pines, far from where the rocks were shooting up and out of the bush. as they continued to do so in a loud downpour. My face unceasingly continued to press out at her, smiling. Thinking this was all some kind of sick prank, hence the later text, my mother shouted my name at the top of her lungs, frightened to the core. However, instead of responding, the mouth of the thing that looked like me behind the tree just started moving as if it were mouthing silent words really, really fast. Suddenly, it turned its head to the side and seemed to be talking to someone else behind the tree. My mom said, uh, let, sorry about that. Uh, suddenly, it turned its head to the side and seemed to be talking to someone else behind the tree, my mom said, who couldn't be seen. But she could see a formless black shape hanging against the other side of the tree. That, uh, the girl that looked like me kept staring at my mother and, uh, and doing the silent speed talking, uh, then turning and whispering then turning and whispering to the thing next to her. Then she would turn back and start up again. 
Then, breaking the monotonous spell, she suddenly pointed at the... Uh, then, breaking the monotonous spell, she suddenly pointed straight at my mother and started laughing. My mother screamed and fled to my bedroom on the second story, the only room with a working lock, where she shut herself in and sat at the far end of the bed as the rocks began to pitter-patter against the window downstairs, dry-heaving and weeping in fear. In my room, my mother said she did not feel safe. There was an awful smell and a weird humming noise in the walls, as she described. She tried to pray for a time, giving up, and uh, she tried to pray for a time before giving up and listening to the rocks pelt the walls and windows somewhere in the kitchen. Uh, she caught the distinct, vibrant sound of a window actually smashing, and the weird, continuous humming. Listening more carefully, she could identify at the softest hint. Uh, she could identify it as the softest hint of a mum of uh, uh, the softest hint. Oh my God, where am I? Of a mumbling voice. In absolute horror, she recognized the voice, and then, virtually too afraid to look, she tilted her head up to the closet door, where an awful white face seemed to could be seen staring right at her, mouth contorting and gaping in what sounded like a highly sped-up whispering. The closet door was only a meter away from my mother and it started to open slowly. In an unimaginable explosion of terror, she immediately bot uh, bolted to the door, only to fumble with the lock. Bigger and bigger rocks, rocks came crashing through the window, which burst apart in a spray of glass shards, uh, before finally getting out and uh, staying clear of that... Sorry. Um, rocks crashing through the window the first part, blah, blah, blah. Running out of the house completely, keeping her eyes off the woods. Uh, getting into her car and driving off. She said that she uh, glanced back right at the end of the prolonged drive. She saw two unmistakable human forms standing at my broken window, at my broken bedroom window, watching as her car got further and further away from our house. This would be their final farewell, as my mother never stepped foot in that place again. As my mother told this story, she broke down in tears. I didn't doubt her, and I still don't. I honestly and fully believe that she experienced what she says she did. It was also quite clear that we were done living in that house once and for all. I only went back once with my dad, who I see very rarely now. He came from another state to help us move. Mom had already found a place in town and moved in. My dad and I just loaded up his truck with all that was left inside. Uh, it was a silent, sunny morning when we removed all the stuff and emptied the place. I wish I could say there was some closure, some final spooking to cap it all off, but there wasn't. It was just a relief to be out of there. There are, however, only two things left worth mentioning. One. When we checked out the house for any signs of intruders, we found that several windows, including one in my bedroom and the kitchen, had been smashed and rocks were lying on the floor. Two, Dad went out into the trees for a bit to take a leak. When he came back, he asked how long we'd had the swing set for. Needless to say, we'd never had a swing set, so I was fairly unsettled to discover that 
in the week since we'd gone we'd been gone someone had assembled a rope rope swing set from one of the highest branches of the old pine over the ridge against which was the fallen log i had i'd stopped climbing many many years ago it was obviously new rope and a nicely polished sanded down wooden seat at the base Dad wanted to keep my mind from recent events, he doubted the affair and thought my mother was mentally unstable, said that a neighbor probably set it up, not realizing it was on our property. Of course, he knew as well as I did that we had nearly no neighbors for at least a mile in any direction. There were no houses in all that space, and never in my time living there did I ever see any other signs of human habitation. But I let it all go, and was pleased enough just to say good riddance to that horrible place, as we drove off for good. For the most part, I have found it best to try and forget what had happened. Sometimes I just can't help but ponder it, though it's been long enough now that I no longer feel scared talking about it. But for a long while, I simply couldn't. Seeing as it is Halloween, what a better time to share. My grandma just recently sold the house to a new family, uh, that being a young couple and their little son. Shortly after we moved, despite my mother's desperate insistences that it be left empty. Now she refuses to talk about what happened altogether. I'm less anxious about it, although sometimes I can't help but let my imagination get the better of me. All I can do is think of that old house, the fallen down tree, the new occupants, and the swing out back. Gently spinning in the breeze as that little boy toddles obliviously towards it. The end. Hmm. Eight o'clock. Right. Elmira. Uh, Mr. Grim Reaper Pasta. The Nightman versus the Dayman. VMYK. Lurks. Drapsnat. Alessandra. 8. HVDES. 0101 Ella. Zero zero Rihanna. Hmm. I wonder how many of those are actual people. Okay, so that was an interesting story. Now, uh, as I started reading it, I realized I had actually heard it narrated before. I forget who. Actually, I think I've heard it narrated multiple times um, by some of those uh, 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 true horror story uh, narrators. I never thought I'd actually see it in um, on the Creepypasta wiki. So, there's that. Oh, I wish I had snacks. I did not think this through. I will do better on Halloween. I will be doing this again Halloween, um, one hour later, from 7, uh, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um... This was sort of a last-minute thing. It's Friday the 13th. I, in October, I had to do something. Um, so I decided to do this. And, um, yeah. With all of a day's notice. Hence why I have a rousing crowd of two people. Um, let's see here.
Oh, I know this person. Imperial. What stories did they... Hmm. Okay. Um, none of these. I could have sworn I have narrated a few of this person's stories. Oh, I know I wanted to uh, narrate this little trilogy. Um, I'm not going to do that tonight because um, I am familiar with it and it, it just doesn't quite, I don't know, feel like something I'm going to do tonight. Um, interesting. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, there is one in particular that I was looking for. Um, Oh yes, uh, I was going to do, I'm going to actually uh, use the restroom again because yay liquids. Right, I'm back. Now, what to do next? I do believe I had been given a narration recommendation by Elmira. Um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, let's see, what was it called? The Quest of Irinon. Uh, let's see, I believe that is a Lovecraftian tale. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Ooh, what was... That was weird. Sudden shift in light. Um, the quest for Iranon. Hmm. Not there. What about? Oh, whoops. Quest of Iranon, 151. 
I've never read this one before, so this is going to be new. Or if I have, it was ages ago. Um, here we go. <clears throat> All right. Um, the Quest of Iranon. Perhaps the best and most poignant of Lovecraft's Dunsanian tales. The Quest of Iranon was written in, on February 28th, 1921. Enjoy your box. Um, as he wrote in a letter, I am picking up a new style lately, running to pathos as well as horror. The best thing I have yet done is the quest of Irinon, whose English, Samuel, uh, Loveman, calls the most musical and flowing I have yet written. In later years, Lovecraft condemned the story as excessively mawkish, uh, but it is in reality a pungent satire on the Protestant work ethic in its depiction of a city where people work only in order to work some more. Sound familiar? Gotta get that grind, yo! Uh, the story took a long time to see print, appearing in The Galleon for July in August of 1935. Wow. It's almost 15 years later that this story he wrote got printed. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. And this, this is a little longer than the last one, so you will have to bear with me. Um, this may very well be my last story for the night. I might keep streaming um, and just hang out with people. Um, or I'll take things over to Discord, and if anybody wants, we can hang out. I, I don't know. I'm bored tonight. I have nothing else going on, so here we are. Here we are. I'm poor, too. Uh. Into the granite city of Teloth wandered the youth. Vine crowned, his yellow hair glistening, with myrrh and his purple robe torn with briars of the mountain Sidrak that lies across the antique bridge of stone. The men of Taloth are dark and stern, and dwell in square houses, and with frowns they asked the stranger whence he had come, and what were his name and fortune. So the youth answered, I am Irinon, and come from Era, a fair city that I recall only dimly, but seek to find again. I am a singer of songs that I learned in the fair sit in the far city, and my calling is to make beauty with the things remembered of childhood. My wealth is in little memories and dreams, and in hopes that I sing in gardens when the moon is tender and the west wind stirs the lotus buds. When the men of Taloth heard these things, they whispered to one another, for though in the granite city there is no laughter or song, the stern men sometimes look to the Carthian hills in the spring and think of the lutes of distant Unai, whereof travelers have told, uh, whereof travelers had told. And thinking thus, they bade the stranger stay and sing in the square before the tower of Melin though they liked not the color of his tattered robe, nor the myrrh in his hair, nor his chaplet of vine leaves, nor the youth in his golden voice. At evening, Irinon sang, and while he sang, an old man prayed, and a blind man said he saw a nimbus over the singer's head. But most of the men of Taloth yawned, and some laughed, and some went away to sleep, for Irinon told nothing useful 
singing only his memories, his dreams, and his hopes. I remember the twilight, the moon and soft songs, and the window where I was rocked to sleep, and through the window was the street where the golden lights came. And where the shadows danced on houses of marbles, I remember the square of moonlight on the floor that was not like any other light, and the visions that danced in the moonbeams when my mother sang to me. And too, I remember the sun of morning bright above the many colored hills in summer. About finished? and the sweetness of flowers born on the south wind that made the trees sing. One downside of a book this size, kind of a pain in the ass to hold up and actually, you know, read from. O oh, Era, city of marble and beryl, how many are thy beauties! How loved am I the warm and fragrant groves across the hyaline Nithra, and the falls of the tiny craw that flowed through the verdant valley. In those groves, in that vale... Cat is in a narrow box and has an itch. Thus, noise. In those groves and in that vale, the children wove wreaths for one another, and at dusk I dreamed strange dreams under the yath trees on the mountain as I saw below me the lights of the city and the curving Nithra reflecting a ribbon of stars. And in the city were palaces of veined and tinted marble, with golden do domes and painted walls, and green gardens with cerulean pools and crystal fountains. Often I played in the gardens and waded in the pools, and lay and dreamed among the pale flowers under the trees, and sometimes, at sunset, I would climb the long, hilly street to the citadel and the open place, and look down upon Era, the magic city of marble and beryl, splendid in a robe of golden flame. Long have I missed there. All right. <laughs> Long have I missed thee, Era, for I was but young when we went into exile. But my father was thy king, and I shall come again to thee, for it is so decreed of fate. All through seven lands have I sought thee, and some day shall I reign over thy groves and gardens thy streets and palaces, and sing to men who shall know whereof I sing, and laugh not nor turn away, for I am Iranon, who was a prince in Era. That night the men of Taloth lodged the stranger in a stable, and in the morning an archon came to him and told him to go to the shop of Arthok the cobbler, and be apprenticed to him. But I am Iranon, a singer of songs, he said, and have no heart for the cobbler's trade. All in Taloth must toil, replied the Archon, for that is the law. Then said Iranon, Wherefore do ye toil? Is it not that ye... Oh, yeah, wherefore do ye toil? Is it not that ye may live and be happy? And if ye toil only that ye may toil more, when shall happiness find you? 
Ye toil to live, but is not life made of beauty and song? And if ye suffer no singers among you, where shall be the fruits of your toil? Toil without song is like weary journey without an end. Were not death more pleasing? But the archon was sullen, and did not understand, and rebuked the stranger. Thou art a strange youth, and I like not thy face, nor thy voice. The words thou speakest are blasphemy, for the gods of Taloth have said that toil is good. Our gods have promised in a haven of light beyond death, where there shall be rest without end, and crystal coldness amidst which none shall vex his mind with thought or his eyes with beauty. Go thou then to Athok the cobbler, or be gone out of the city by sunset. All here must serve, and song is folly. Right. Song is folly. Oh, sounds like my uh, my father as I took up theater in my youth. Now I am a proud and accomplished payment processor. Fuck my life. So Irinon went out of the stable and walked over the narrow stone streets between the gloomy square houses of granite, seeking something green in the air of spring. But in Taloth, nothing, uh, but in Taloth was nothing green, for all was of stone. On the faces of men were frowns, but by the stone embankment along the sluggish river Zuro sate a young boy with sad eyes, gazing into the waters to spy green budding branches, washed down from hills by the fishnets. And the boy said to him, Art thou not indeed he of whom the archon tell? Who seekest a far city in a far fair land? I am Romnod, and born of the blood of Taloth, but am not old in the ways of the granite city, and yearn daily for the warm groves and the distant lands of beauty and song. Beyond the Carthian hills lieth Uonai, the city of lutes and dancing, which men whisper of and say is both lovely and terrible. Thither would I go, were I old enough to find the way, and thither shouldest, shouldst thou go, and thou wouldst sing and have men listen to thee. Let us leave the city, to Loth, and fare together among the hills of spring. Thou shalt shew me the ways of travel, and I will attend thy songs at evening when the stars one by one bring dreams to the minds of dreamers. And peradventure it may be that Urnai, the city of lutes and dancing, is even the fair era thou seekest. For it is told that thou hast not known era since old days, and a name often changeth, Oh, <clears throat> and a name often changeth. Let us go to Uonai, O Irinon of the Golden Head, where men shall know our longings and welcome us as brothers, nor ever laugh or frown at what we say. And Irinon answered, Be it so, small one. If any in this stone place yearns for beauty, he must seek the mountains and beyond and I would not leave thee to pine by the sluggish Zuro. But think not that delight and understanding dwell just across the Carthian hills, or in any spot thou canst find in a day's or a year's or a lustrum's journey. Behold, when I was small like thee, I dwelt in the valley of Narthos by the frigid Zari, where none would listen to my dreams. 
and I told myself that when older I would go to Sinara on the southern slope and sing to smiling dromedary men in the marketplace, uh, to smiling dromedary men in the marketplace. But when I went to Sinara, I found the dromedary men all drunken and ribald, and saw that their songs were not as mine. So I traveled in barge down the Zari to onyx Wall Jaren. And the soldiers of Jaren laughed at me and drave me out, so that I wandered to many other cities. I have seen St Stethelos, that is below the great cataract, and have gazed on the marsh where Sarnath once stood. I have been to Thra, Larnak, and Kedatharon, on the winding river I, and have dwelt long in Olathoi, in the land of Lomar. But though I have had listeners sometimes, they have ever been few, and I know that welcome shall await me only in Era. The city of marble and beryl, where my father once ruled as king. So for error we shall seek. Though it, though it were well to visit distant and loot-blessed Uonai across the Carthian hills, which may indeed be error, though I think not. Era's beauty is past imagining, and none can tell of it without rapture. Whilst Uonai... The camel drivers whisper leeringly. At the sunset, Iranon and small Romnod went forth from Teloth. And for, oh God, this is a pain in the ass to hold. <laughs> and went forth. Uh, let's see here. long wandered amidst the green hills and cool forests. The way was rough and obscure, and never did they seem nearer to Uonai, the city of lutes, and dancing, but in the dusk as the stars came out, Iranon would sing of Era and its beauties, and Ramnod would listen, so that they were both happy after a fashion. They ate plentifully of fruit, and red berries, and marked not the passing of time. But many years must have slipped away. Small Ramnod was now not so small, and spoke deeply instead of shrilly, though Iranon was always the same, and decked his golden hair with vines and fragrant rosins found in the wood. So it came to pass one day that Ramnod seemed older than Iranon, though he had been very small when Iranon had found him watching for green budding branches in Teloth beside the sluggish stone-banked Zuro. Then one night, when the moon was full, the travelers came to a mountain crest and looked down upon the myriad lights of Uonai. Peasants had told them they were near, and Iranon knew that this was not his native city of Era. The lights of Uonai were not like those of Era, for they were harsh and glaring, while the lights of Era shine and as softly and magically as shone the moonlight on the floor by the window where Iranon's mother once rocked him to sleep with song. But Uonain was a city of lutes and dancing. So Iranon and Ramnod went down the steep slope so that they might find men to whom songs and dreams would bring pleasure. And when they were come into the town, they found rose-wreathed revelers bound from house to house and leaning from windows and balconies who listened to the songs of Iranon and tossed him flowers and applauded when he was done. That for a moment did Iranon believe he had found those who thought and felt even as he though the town was not a hundredth as fair as Era. <clears throat> Hello, newcomers! 
I am reading The Quest of Iranon by H.P. Lovecraft. It is one of his more uh, fantastic tales. When dawn came, Iranon looked about with dismay. For the domes of Uunai were not golden in the sun, but gray and dismal. And the men of Uunai were pale with reveling and dull with wine. And unlike the radiant men of Era, but because the, per the people had thrown him blossoms and acclaimed his songs, Iranon stayed on, and with him Ramnod, who liked the revelry of the town and wore in his dark hair roses and myrtle. Often at night, Iranon sang to the revelers, but he was always as before, crowned only with the vine of the mountains and remembering the marble streets of Era and the hyaline Nithra. In the frescoed halls of the monarch did he sing upon a crystal dais raised over a floor that was a mirror, and as he sang, he brought pictures to his bearers, sorry, he brought pictures to his hearers, till the floor seemed to reflect old, beautiful, and half-remembered things instead of the wine-reddened feasters who pelted him with roses. And the king bade him put away his tattered purple and clothed him in satin and cloth of gold, with rings of green jade and bracelets of tinted ivory, and lodged him in a gibble in a gilded, sorry, uh, and tapestry chamber on a bed of sweet can carven wood with canopies and coverlets of flower-embroidered silk. Thus dwelt Iranon in Uonai, the city of lutes and dancing. <clears throat> it is not known how long Iranon tarried in Uonai, but one day the king brought to the palace some wild whirling dancers from the Liranian desert and dusky flute players from Drinin in the east. And after the revelers threw their roses not so much at Iranon as at the dancers and the flute players, and day by day that Ramnod, who had been a small boy in granite Teloth, grew coarser and redder with wine, till he dreamed less and less and listened with less delight to the songs of Iranon. But though Iranon was, said, was sad, he ceased not to sing, and at evening told again his dreams of Era, the city of marble and beryl. Then, one night, the red and fatted, fattened Romnod snorted heavily amidst the poppied silks of his banquet couch, and died writhing, whilst Iranon, pale and slender, sang to himself in a far corner. And when Iranon had wept over the grave of Ramnod, and strown it with green budding branches, such as Ramnod used to love, he put aside his silks and gods, and went forgotten out of Uonai, the city of lutes and dancing, clad only in the ragged purple in which he had come, and garlanded with fresh vines from the mountains. <clears throat> Into the sunset wandered Iranon, seeking still for his native land and for men who would understand and cherish his songs and dreams. In all the cities of Sidathria, and in the lands beyond the ben the Benazic. <laughs> Sorry, that just threw me off. Um, in all the cities of Sidathria, and in the lands beyond the Benazic desert, gray-faced children laughed at his olden songs and tattered robes of robe of purple. But Iranon stayed ever young, and wore wreaths upon his golden head, whilst he sang of Era, delight of the past and hope of the future. So came he one night to the squalid cot 
of an antique shepherd, bent and dirty, who kept lean flocks on a stony slope above a quicksand marsh. To this man Irinon spoke, as to so many others. Canst thou tell me where I may find Era, the city of marble and beryl, where flows the hyaline Nithra, and where falls the tiny cross sing to verdant valleys and hills forsti forested with yaf trees? And the shepherd, hearing, looked long and strangely at Iranon, as if recalling something very far away in time, and noted each line of the stranger's face, and his golden hair, and his crown of vine leaves. But he was old and shook his head as he replied, O oh, stranger, I have indeed heard the name of Era, and the other names thou hast spoken. But they come to me from afar down the waste of long years. I heard them in my youth from the lips of a playmate, a beggar's boy green to strange dreams, who would weave long tales about the moon and the flowers and the west wind. We used to laugh at him, for we knew him from his birth, though he thought himself a king's son. He was comely, even as thou, but full of folly and strangeness, and he ran away when small to find those who would listen gladly to his songs and dreams. How often hath he sung to me of lands that never were, and things that never can be. Of Era did he speak much, of Era and the river Nithra, and the falls of the tiny craw. There would he ever say he once dwelt as a prince, though here we knew him from his birth. Nor was there ever a marble city of Era, nor those who could delight in strange songs, save in the dreams of mine old playmates, Iranon, who is gone. And in the twilight, as the stars came out one by one, and the moon cast on the marsh a radiance like that which a child sees quivering on the floor as he is rocked to sleep at evening, there walked into the lethal quicksands a very old man in tattered purple, crowned with withered vine leaves, and gazing ahead as if upon the golden domes of a fair city where dreams are understood. That night, something of youth and beauty died in the elder world. That's a good one. <clears throat> Lovecraft was a racist bastard, but he did have a way with words. Who do we have? Who is our newcomer? Is it J.V. Shero, Drapsnap? Uh, H, uh, 8HVDES? No, I'm pretty sure I saw those. No? Anyway, welcome all the same. We had a fourth, but they seem to have disappeared. Um, oh. oh, 842. Maybe, maybe an original. Um, let's see. I think I have enough time. Oh, whoops, that's the wrong. I think next time I do this, I'm going to skip the contacts. Uh, okay, 
so I've, I've definitely done this one before, if anybody has been, um, oh shit, if anybody has been to one of my live streams, um, oh, that's a Z, not an S, there we are, that's what it is. So if you have been to one of my live streams, then you have, you have seen this, um, or do they have... I know they had dark mode somewhere. View. Uh, print of blah, blah, blah. Mode. Ah, oh, do they have it? Ah, crap, they don't. Okay. Well, that's irritating. It's going to be all bright and blinding. Um. Oh. That is not the right one. I stand corrected. Uh, I may just, I may just go through my phone. That, for some reason, has dark mode. There we go. Is this the right one? Ah, here we go. All right. So, for what is likely the last story of the evening, um, as I said, this event was going to go from 6 to 9. <sighs> nice. Um, I present unto you an original piece. It is called The Whisperer of Nightmares. A uh, little backstory. Um, I have a series of stories, it's a very small series currently, um, that are sort of fables, if you will, myths, um, as it were, of boogeymen in a fashion. And these boogeymen are all based on uh, themes. Um, there is the tale, of the tragic tale of Mr. Twist, Wait, no, that's not the tragic tale. It's just the tale of Mr. Twist, sorry. Um, which is uh, essentially an origin story about the invisible friend that your child has that may not be um, quite so imaginary. Um, invisible, sure. Imaginary, not so much. Um, there is the tragedy of um, Aria and Professor Treble. Um, which delves into um, uh, uh, fear of the loss of inspiration. Um, and then, of course, there is the Whisper of Nightmares, which is my answer to um, well, you'll see. <clears throat> oh, Whisper of Nightmares, you poor forgotten girl. Your hair is dark and stringy now, no more luster and curl. You used to laugh, you used to play and dream the sweetest dreams. Now you crawl from closets and turn sleepers' dreams to screams. Your father was a carpenter, he worked late into the night. He'd come home from his workshop and tuck you in real tight. He'd tell you tales of wonder, of adventure, and of myth of a princess and her dragon friend, whom she traveled with. Except on those nights when the moon hung fat and high, when he'd work down in the basement, though he never did say why. You'd hear the sound of screaming saws and the hammering of nails, and when he came to tuck you in, he'd tell the darkest tales. He'd tell of monstrous beasts and men who'd prey upon the weak, cautionary fables where the strong feasted on the meek. If the heroines and the heroes managed to win out in the end, it was a pyrrhic victory at best, at least that was the trend. He'd always leave you with a warning, his eyes weary, cold, and gray. With dirty hand, he'd brush back your hair, and softly he would say, 
when the shadows are thick and there are nightmares around. Remember this, my dear. Make not a whisper. Make not a sound. No whisper of nightmares, were that all, then you'd be fine. Not all tales need good to prevail and end with bunnies and sunshine. We both know that's just the start of these dark and dreary dreams. For yours is a tragic tale, my dear, and ends in a symphony of screams. The carpenter had a secret, I fear, tied to dark and ancient lore, a gruesome obligation that lay underneath the floor. Just as there's forbidden knowledge that could cause apocalyptic end, there are forbidden doors, my dear, and they want to be opened. Beneath the floor one such door strained against its locks and chains, and beyond this horrific gateway lay nightmare's hellish domain. To keep it sealed it was revealed, required a sacrifice of blood, and over the years, and over many a year, your father, I fear, delivered it in a flood. Then one night, as you lay awake, awaiting your evening fable, the screaming saws fell into silence that was certainly unstable. Perhaps you might recall the moon that night, hung fat and colored red. While you laid in bed, your anxious head filled itself with thoughts of dread. Then a scream of rage, a cry of pain, running footsteps down below. The slam of a door, then silence once more, announced your coming woe. Your eyes full of fear, tears, your thoughts full of fears, you crept to that basement lair, and saw your father lay bleeding, his heart final beating at the bottom of the stair. O oh, whisper of nightmares, you did not deserve your fate. Wicked plots and machinations made you a victim of their hate. You were but a pawn, I am afraid, in a game as old as time, by maddening forces of a scope inconceivably sublime. You certainly could not be blamed for running to your father's side, Alas, though, how could you know that it would have been best to hide? For while your attention was on him, his was on that blackened gate, and the roiling shadows within that seemed to silently await. The carpenter was far too injured to keep you from turning around, so he hoped that you'd recall what to do when nightmares did abound. But what young child could be blamed for letting out a fearful screech after looking upon the nightmares that filled that hellish breach? And I'm afraid desperation is the explanation for what happened next. For with his last strength your father grabbed you and marked you with a hex. With cries of rage the nightmares fled their cage, but their victory was spoiled, for your father knew that you were the last chance for their freedom to be foiled. As the fiends ripped themselves from their cage and fled that black portal, they yearned to unleash hell on earth and torture every mortal. But as you screamed, the hex gleamed, and into you they were imprisoned, and from the weeping ashes of this tragedy, the whisper of nightmares had arisen. Now, O oh whisper of nightmares, you seek the sleeper's dreams, for the prison you've become is nearly bursting at the seams. So you crawl out from closet or from underneath the bed and relieve yourself of nightmares by whispering them into their heads. O oh, whisper of nightmares, sometime the sleepers do awake, 
though they can only watch you crawl to them while silently they quake. Then upon their prone forms you do climb, as horror does paralyze. These poor souls whose dreams, for their own sake, you must terrorize. No whisper of nightmares, you poor forgotten girl. Your hair is dark and stringy now, no more luster and curl. You used to laugh, you used to play and dream the sweetest dreams. Now you crawl from closets and turn sleepers' dreams to screams. And seven minutes remaining. That is where we shall stop. I hope those of you who made it through have enjoyed this uh, evening of narrations. Um, I'll call this a sort of preliminary for Halloween, um, which I hope to have a little more preparation for. I'm going to dig up a few more um, Halloween-themed stories. I'm going to practice them ahead of time so that I'm not stumbling over them. And um, maybe I won't wear the contacts, or maybe I will, and I'll just read from my phone since um, I can hold that closer to my face and not have the blur kick in when I'm trying to read from a monitor that is over there. There. Yes, um, three hours with only a couple pee breaks. Not bad for my first time back to streaming in who knows how long. Uh, now I've got to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my evening. I kind of want to go somewhere, but I do not have money. I'll have to see. Anyway, I hope you all had fun. I might stream again and just do a hangout stream. I don't know, but I need to move this chair back where it's supposed to be because it is not meant for a computer desk. Um, and, uh, yeah. Have a good night, everybody. Um, or, as I am wont to say at the end of my podcast, Good night, my creepy kitties! And of course, pleasant dreams. <laughs>